Okay, so good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our the Quattro Center's monthly meeting for folks who are involved in post-conviction litigation and investigation work. Um, as everybody knows, I think this is a, a meeting set out for prosecutors and defense counsel um, to be able to present on issues that are common to the investigations and litigations of these claims and kind of really try to promote a um, move toward best practices, but also trying to give information for folks which is helpful in these regions. As you know, this is funded by a grant from the Bureau of Justice Administration. We are the tech, uh, technical training assistance provider for those receiving funds under the Upholding Rule of Law grant, as well as the Wrongful Conviction Prevention Program. Um, but this program is particularly open to anybody who is interested and who is within the field. Um, so everybody knows we have recently launched a website um, called convictionreview.net. I'll put that in the chat. All of the prior recordings are available on a link through that as well as a link through the YouTube channel, which we have set up. And there are materials that are on that site that are really aimed toward prosecutors setting up or revamping conviction review programs. They include um, resources that we have developed here at the Quattrone Center along with, with input from lots of folks all around the country as well as some materials from our partners at Healing Justice, which is a nonprofit that works with victims and tries to help them through the post-conviction investigation litigation sphere. Um, we have those available up there as well. So, and if, as always, if there are questions, please feel free to reach out to us at any time. Um, for those of you who are willing, um, at the end of this, at the close of this, what I'd like to do is try to kind of brainstorm ways to be able to make better use of this space for everybody. So we have 50 people online from all around the country who do this work. And you know, rather than being able to prevent, present trainings as helpful as they are, I'd like to try to think through ways that we can provide a space for folks to kind of talk to, to each other, um, at least in this once a month space, be that through break, breakout rooms or um, other guided discussions, maybe presenting questions to present to the group ahead of time. So we can really help you guys reach out with each other and work together to try to solve problems that you may be having or even just address issues that you don't find any other way. This work can be very isolating on, on both sides of, of the aisle and we want to try to pr promote more uh, sharing and cooperative work together. So if we, even you know, as fascinating as Dr. Claire is, and I'm so grateful that she's with us, I'd like to, if you're able to stay after for a couple minutes and, and kind of give ideas or talk through that, I'd appreciate it. And just as a warning, as you are logging off today, there'll be a pop-up poll um, that I ask you to take quickly. It's three questions so that we can give feedback to BJA on how these uh, trainings are going. So with all of that as preliminary, um, I apologize. I would ask everybody to mute yourselves because we do have 50 folks on the line. It gets a little distracting. If you have questions for Dr. Claire as we're going through, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll uh, kind of relay them out. Um, and then she, after her presentation, she's kind of aimed, I think, if Maria, 50 minutes, I think is what we said, right, is her kind of goal to be able to leave plenty of time and space for questions or follow up for you. So with that, um, so I'm, we are just so happy to have Dr. Maria Claire with us today. She is a um, PhD in the Department of Criminology at the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> Um, her specialty is statistics, and that's kind of what her background is, but she works in the forensic science field. So she is you know, just an incredible resource for everybody in terms of understanding forensics. What do the statistical analyses mean that come with forensics? What makes forensics reliable or not reliable? What is an error rate? What do all these reports mean that we have from PCAST and NAS and others? You know, how do we read them as practitioners? How do we apply them to the cases that we've been reviewing and how, how can we kind of look to analyze things in a different way? So Dr. Claire is going to be presenting on all of this for us. Um, and I warned her to keep it at a high level um, in terms of understanding, which is not that high. So um, hopefully we can cover a lot of ground. This may be familiar for some of you, new for, new for some of you. Um, you know, by all means, we're trying to paint it broad. So, Dr. Claire, we're just so thrilled that you're joining us. Let me just kind of take a second to try to meet everybody. Um, not to be rude, but there we go. And then, okay. And Dr. Claire just asked you to unmute and then take it for, over for us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marissa. It's an honor to be able to present to you guys today. Um, I do recognize a couple of names. I guess we might have been 
in like similar mailing lists or something. Um, but yeah, so I wanted to tell you today about um, the statistical basis of forensic science. Marissa, I think that I will, I think you need to stop sharing your screen so I can share my screen. Okay, great. So yeah, so um, as Marissa said, I am a professor in the Department of Criminology, but my training is in statistics. And I've been teaching a class in the criminology department that's about the statistical foundations on forensic science um, for a few years now. And this year is the first time we're doing it online. And it's the first time that they didn't cap the class. So it used to be that it was capped at 20 undergraduate students at Penn. And then now they just opened it up and all of a sudden it was 80 students. Um, and so I think it's something that people are interested in. Um, and it's all been on Zoom. So that's, yeah, it's a crazy experience, but I'm getting really good at Zoom. So that's anything positive coming out of that. Okay, so I'm gonna start out telling you about two noteworthy forensic errors. Marissa will know these uh, backwards and forwards, but I think that they're good, um, they're good examples for telling you about the details about the, um, the foundations that I'll talk about later. Then I'll talk about um, important concepts that are coming from these recent reviews of forensics, um, the National Academies report and PCAST, and then just my perspective on them. And then finally, I'll just do a summary about um, the PCAST review, uh, its conclusions about the disciplines and how, whether they're foundationally valid. Um, so yeah. Let's begin. Okay, so there's a Brandon Mayfield case. A lot of you might be familiar with this. Uh, so um, it was a case of the Madrid bombings. I think it was 2004. Um, there was the bomb and the lead that they had was a partial fingerprint that was found inside a plastic bag that they thought um, might be where the detonators for the bombs were contained. So the scene mark that I'm showing down here was the, the piece of evidence they had for figuring out who had set up these bombs. And the Spanish National Police asked for help from the FBI. And the FBI ran this scene mark through an algorithm uh, and looking for possible matches in a database. And they did find um, some candidate matches. Uh, the top one was this one from an attorney, uh, Brandon Mayfield. And uh, examiners actually looked at this print uh, the candidate print from the algorithm, compared it to the scene mark and said, yes, indeed, this is, uh, this is the guy. Um, so they, you know, um, Brennan Mayfield was imprisoned for about two weeks. And then later, the Spanish National Police found a different candidate through their own search, um, a man called uh, Daoud. And they had a better reason for believing that he had committed the crime. He was an Algerian national and I guess had a history of something related to terrorism. I don't know all the details about that, but the point was that uh, the FBI then said, wait a minute, we had a perfect match. Um, what do you mean you have a different match? What does that mean? And so the FBI actually flew over to Spain, took a look at the Daoud mark and they said, actually, man, we were wrong. You're right, this is actually the match and ours was close, but it's not as close as yours. Um, so they released Mayfield, gave a huge apology, and then wrote a very interesting, uh, very long report. It's 330 pages about where their, where their analysts went wrong. Um, this was very, I think, uh, I don't know if embarrassing is the right word, but it's, it's a big um, red flag because um, fingerprints, latent fingerprint analysis, is historically it's one of the oldest uh, types of forensic analysis and it's known to be a very solid type of analysis I think in for for lay people just like anyone walking down the street and so this was an interesting case study not just about you know the Mayfield case but also what are the potential downfalls of fingerprint identification and you know they thought well what went wrong so there is some contextual bias so the first thing is, you know, the algorithm is telling the analysts that this is the best candidate. Um, and so that might affect what the analysts uh, conclude, right? Maybe if they hadn't known that, they would have said something different. 
Other analysts, um, they spoke to each other. There was a verification stage. And so maybe other analysts' opinions could have affected the final conclusion. And then finally, it was just a very high profile case. There was a lot of pressure for the examiners to come with a, um, with a conclusion to find a, a, a person. And the mark seemed, this is something else I should say, is the mark was very similar. Um, uh, there's this other possible problem where um, there is possibly reverse reasoning. So this is what uh, this is what I mean by reverse reasoning. So you can see that. So focus on the left two prints on the screen here. So this is coming from a so some software from a forensic lab, where the um, the marks in red mean that they are, so this is the two prints are being marked up at the same time. So when the analyst is marking up the latent print from the crime scene, uh, they can also see the exemplar print from the suspect and they mark them at the same time. So red means that the examiner has seen the exemplar print. So all of these marks are in red and you can imagine that in these parts where there's kind of missing information and there's a, like blurry image or it's maybe too dark, uh, it's possible that an analyst might look at the clean print and think, well, yeah, I can kind of see that this minutia is also found in the, in the latent print. Hmm, yeah, sure, I'll mark that. And so this, the image from the clean print might be biasing the, the latent print. And, there is some research to show that this actually happens. And so the, this software from this lab, they, they were proposing a solution for this and say, they said, okay, first mark up without, so for now focus on the two images on the right. Have the analyst only see the latent print, mark that up, that'll all be shown in yellow. So this is before seeing the clean exemplar print. <coughs> and then once you see the clean print, mark that up, and then finally compare the two the sets of minutia. And if you wanna go back to the latent print and mark it up again, then it's gonna turn red. Whatever you mark after observing the clean print will be red. So this is just, you know, there was this idea that there was reverse reasoning that they were marked up simultaneously. Whatever the, the examiner saw in the exemplar prints, they might've thought they saw in the, clean, in the latent prints, they might've not seen it. This is a solution for that that someone proposed in a lab. But it just shows you that there, you know, there's just a lot of, like because the latent print is missing information a lot of the time, um, there's a possibility for, for error that, um, yeah, and it's, and it's also dependent on, you know, there's a lot of human decision-making. And so, yeah, so errors can really come from, from this kind of uh, reasoning. So these are all just psychological factors that I'm naming here. Um, but there are also just, there's a question of fingerprint identification in general. Um, and there are many other things to say about the Mayfield case that I'm not gonna go into right now, but um, this is just more about fingerprints in general. So there's the first thing, which is that there are two fundamental assumptions made in fingerprints. There's fingerprints are unique, right? And this is something that I think everyone's been told forever about fingerprints. And, it's just an idea that like we, I think we take for granted. Um, it's an assumption, it hasn't been proven. Um, we have no, no idea that it's right, but that's what's assumed. And then um, secondly, you know, there's assumption, an assumption that we can determine which print belongs to a specific person. Like maybe we can't. So like, that's more about the application. So the idea of uniqueness, the, the National Academies report just says uniqueness is commonly assumed. Um, but there's no real reason for this. Um, there are some suggestions that fingerprints might be unique. When I took a FBI course on fingerprint identification, it, I was told that you know because identical twins, they have the same DNA, but different fingerprints, you, know, you would think like if, if they don't have the same print, no one's gonna have the same print, right? Um, and then I was also told that, uh, you know, because we are individuals, but even in our own two thumbs, our prints are different, uh, that means that just everyone's print is different. Um, 
I was told that because the the fetus develops, uh, so like the fingerprints develop um, in in utero, and the fetus is moving uh, with random movements, and the fetus pushes against the the womb with some force in random ways, and so that's what creates these ridges. Um, and because these movements are random, it must be that the that each fingerprint is unique. Um, Francis Galton in 1892 was a big, uh, he, he didn't really say that they were unique, but he was really interested in this theory and he was really testing it uh, in different ways. He's the only one who I've seen has a statistical argument for why fingerprints could be unique and it doesn't really even apply to today. He says they would be unique if there were only like, I think it's 4 billion people on earth, which we don't have anymore. Um, so, and the other, there are some things that are, it's just not very specific. So what is, what is unique? Is it the finger that's unique, the 3D finger, or is it the 2D representation on a surface? Um, there's some information that's lost when you go from 2D to 3D. And, and what do we even mean by unique? Is it that everyone who's alive today has different fingerprints? Or is it that everyone who has ever lived and ever will live have, has different fingerprints? And what about all the people who could live? Um, it's not, I think, defined clearly. Um, and I have doubts. I have doubts about it being unique. If you think about it, the fingerprint itself doesn't have a ton of information on it. It's just like a pretty small area on a finger. And just by chance, couldn't it be that two people are, you know, have prints that are just so similar that we cannot tell them apart? Maybe like at the electron level, right? If you had an electron microscope they, at the atomic level, you could see that they're different, but the way that we're observing it, maybe we can't tell them apart. And I think that that's um, it's not exactly what happened with the Mayfield print, but I think it's close. It, just by chance, two random people across the globe had really similar fingerprints. And so there were some errors in the analysis by the FBI. There is contextual bias. There were things that they could have improved but also like fingerprints can just be repeated, you know? And it's that I think that that's something that we have to uh, accept. And so the, the type of analysis that we should do should be a little different. We should not assume that they're unique, but instead we can work with coming up with probabilities that, uh, you know, two prints are coming from the same source versus that they're coming from a different source. And that's exactly what's done with DNA. With DNA, we never assume that people have unique DNA. We just have an idea of the frequency of the allele distributions in a population, and we provide a random match probability that tells us the probability that we're, we're making a mistake uh, by saying that these two people are, you know, or this, uh, that the two source, the two samples were from the same source. So that tells us, you know, like we think this is a match and this is a probability that we would be wrong but it never assumes it's unique. And so that's what I think we should be doing, not assuming uniqueness, but instead um, coming up with probabilities for, for errors. Um, in terms of error rates for fingerprints, there are very few appropriately designed black box studies. So a black box study, I'll talk about more in a minute, but it's a way to measure an error rate for a forensic discipline, a subjective forensic discipline. Uh, there were two studies, and this was given in the um, in the PCAS report. There was one from 2011 where the false positive rate was found to be one in 306, and that means that uh, how many people do we have here today? We have 50 people. All right, if we had like six times six times this population, there would be at least one mistake. Um, it's very high of an error rate. Um, a Miami Dade 2014 study found that it, the positive, false positive rate was one in 18, super high. Um, and these were the only two studies that were found to be appropriately designed for measuring error rates for fingerprints. Um, and Maria, if you could just, um, when you say error rate in the fingerprint world, you mean a false positive that somebody was claiming a match when in fact there isn't a match? That's a really good question. I talk about that a little bit soon, but oh, sorry. <laughs> there are different ways to give error rates and an appropriately designed study will give you false positive and false negative rates. Um, 
and yeah so i think people focus more on false positive rates because uh there's this idea that you will probably I guess you might agree, but I don't know. I, I, I agree with it, that um, a false positive is worse than a false negative. Convicting someone who's innocent is worse. It's more costly to society than uh, not capturing someone who's guilty. But anyway, that's, a, that's just my opinion. So, um, but in any case, we'll talk about error rates more in a second. Um, but basically for fingerprints, like this is kind of not the gold standard. I mean, DNA, uh, single sort of like high quality DNA is our gold standard. DNA, I mean, fingerprints is like the next level up and the false positive rate there, the error rate is substantially higher than what's expected by many jurors. And, uh, you know, a lot of people think there's like infallibility of fingerprint analysis and actually they're just, it's like a very high error rate. <clears throat> I mean, if we go with, with the second one, it's almost like, you know, there would be like maybe two or three people who were listening to this who would be wrongfully convicted just based on, on this kind of evidence. Now, we need more studies like this, right? Only two is not really enough, but just the little bit that we know is pretty, pretty deficient. Um, so that was fingerprints. And now I'll tell you about the case of Keith Harward and this is the case of bite marks. So uh, Keith, he was uh, wrongfully convicted. And so he was shown here on the left before he was convicted and on the right after he was released. And these bite marks are not from that crime scene, but they're just what bite marks tend to look like. Um, but in his case, and I won't go into too much detail, but it was a rape case and bite mark evidence is what was found against him. Uh, and then later uh, DNA actually uh, helped exonerate him and they, they found the person who actually committed the crime. Um, but I think he had already passed away once they found who it was. Um, and Keith was, I, he was in prison for 33 years, I think. So yeah, very big mistake. And what went wrong in this case, uh, you know, there's this question of like, well, but fingerprints is one thing, but what about, what about bite mark evidence? Maybe bite mark analysis just doesn't work, right? And there's this question of what do we mean by by work. So in bite marks, there's also this assumption that bite marks are unique. I'm not aware of any research on that. There's no evidence on that at all. Um, and then uh, this, there's this assumption that we can determine which mark belongs to a person. And there is research on this, <laughs> notably some research by Mary and Peter Bush. Uh, they found that analysts sometimes could not even tell whether a bite mark was a bite mark at all. There was maybe just bruising. Um, and then when they could tell, they couldn't, that it was a bite mark, then they couldn't tell whether it was left by a human or an animal. And so this research, I think just, it was a simple, simple analysis, but it kind of uh, really broke down bite mark analysis. Like if you can't even tell what is a bite mark properly, um, how could you tell whether, you know, someone's teeth, uh, you know, are really, or the, the, yeah, how can you identify an individual based on a bite mark? Um, in terms of error rates, there were very few and poorly designed studies to determine error rates. And they have uh, two that were kind of not great studies, but they, were, they had some false positive rates. They found that it was one in six. Um, so it's extremely high error rate. Here we have almost 10 people who would be wrongfully convicted with bite mark evidence. So how common are these problems? Like I told you, you know, these error rates are super high, um, but is this true for all forensic evidence or just like how common is this? And so the, the NAS report from 20, 2009 and the PCAS report from 2016 really helped, I think, uncover some of these problems from uh, the point of view of scientists outside forensics. The NAS report did have forensic scientists involved in its um, authorship, but the PCAST report was less influenced by forensic. It was more coming from outside. Scientists reviewing like, what are forensic analysts doing and do we think it's the right thing to do? <clears throat> so the 2009 report was written by the National Academies of Science through their National Research Council. 
It was 254 pages long. This was a study that was authorized by Congress. And it was a wake up call to the scientific and legal communities. Uh, it concluded that with the exception of nuclear DNA analysis, no forensic method has been rigorously shown to have the capacity to consistently and with a high degree of certainty demonstrate a connection between evidence and a specific individual or source. Uh, so it was very damning, it was very negative. And in 2016, the PCAS report was trying to answer, okay, well, what's happened since 2009? And uh, what they did more, so the 2009 report was more broad. It has a lot more information about what are these forensic disciplines? It was kind of like, let, let's just even define them. And like, what do analysts do in a way to tell the world about what's happening in forensic science? The PCAS report was it's shorter and it's the goal is just to review articles and find um, validity. So the, the title is Forensic Science in Criminal Courts, Ensuring Scientific Validity of Feature Comparison Methods. So they focused on a few methods and they were focusing on just evaluating whether they were scientifically valid. And just by reviewing articles, really, it wasn't it wasn't even like a you know, interviewing analysts or anything like that. It was just like, let's look at the literature. And they found that there was a need for clarity about the scientific standards for the validity and reliability of forensic methods. Uh, different analysts, different labs, different um, standards defined scientific validity and reliability differently. And there's also a need to evaluate the specific forensic methods to determine whether they've been scientifically established to be valid and reliable. <clears throat> and most of the methods they reviewed did not have properly measured error rates. So something I wanted to say at this point was just, uh, yeah, before we get into this DOJ statement, I wanted to go into just talking about why error rates are important and I think that I've, I've spoken to attorneys in the past and this was helpful. This might not be helpful to you, but I, I think it's um, something that statisticians think is obvious, but may not be obvious to everybody. Okay, so here I'm just gonna tell you about uh, political polling. So just elections, uh, say for president. So suppose that I'm doing um, a poll to see who was gonna win, whether it was Biden or Trump for the presidency. And I tell you that, um, let's say on this side, it's Trump and on this side, it's Biden. Well, I should probably do it the other way around, left and right, uh, <laughs> not that it matters. Okay, um, and so I tell you that I ran a study and I got that, and this is the halfway point, and I got that uh, we're gonna land right here. So I say, yeah, yeah, I surveyed people and, you know, uh, I got that Trump is going to win. Then you might say like, all right, like, who did you survey, <laughs> right? Was it like your two neighbors? Because um, we want to know, you know, who was in the survey. So it's important to say like, okay, first of all, what's the size of the sampled population? If I tell you that I surveyed 100 people, you might say, well, that's kind of crappy, it could be like 100 people doesn't tell you what the entire voting population of the US is gonna go for. Um, so that has to do with the, the sample size and that sample size is gonna determine the width of the error bars, how much error is in my estimate. So if I, if I sample 100 people, I'm gonna guess the error bars are like just massive. They're gonna include almost the entire possible space um, of, the, of the election. So they thought, oh yeah, I surveyed my 100 people and I got that Trump is gonna win. It's like, yeah, but your error bars are huge. That's not really gonna tell us uh, with certainty. And like, that's fine, but you know, you can believe that, but I'm not gonna believe it. I cannot trust this estimate because um, the uncertainty about this estimate is way too high. <clears throat> and so, all right, so I say, okay, fine, fine, fine. So I did the survey again, and but I, this time I surveyed uh, 1 million people. 
So, wow, okay, so that's way better. So fine, like now the error bars are a lot more narrow. Like, oh, wow, okay, so it sounds like Trump is gonna win. But wait, what, which 1 million people did you survey? Like, oh, well, I went to, um, I don't know, what's this Trump stronghold? Uh, Arkansas. And I went to like a city there and I found a million people. And, you know, I found that they're going to, that Trump is going to win. Like, All right. Well, that's not the right million people to go for. You have to get a random sample of the population. Right. And so that's not going to be reflected here, but I have to know that the population that was surveyed is going to represent the country and the popu the voting population of the country. And then once we do that, you know, once we have a properly designed study, I can then trust it. And so I'm not sure what, you know, what actually happened in the, in the polls, but Biden won. So like, let's just say that probably a, a proper study would have been somewhere here with margin of error, like very, very close to um, the estimate. Now, what happened with the, the Hillary um, prediction was that some, I think the, <clears throat> the margin of error was too close to the 50 bar. And so even though they thought, you know, it's still, she's gonna win, it's on the left, uh, the overlap, it was still too close. We didn't know within this margin of error whether it was gonna be um, Trump or Hillary and then Trump won. But this is all just to say, you know, this is a statistical study. It's telling us both an estimate and also the uncertainty about it. And that tangent, I just wanted to go into it because I want to instill in you that having an answer, a conclusion in science is not really enough. I don't, if an analyst tells me, oh, these two fingerprints match, I don't know if I can trust that at all because I don't know the uncertainty related to that conclusion. I always have to know an estimate and an uncertainty. And if you don't tell me both of those things, I cannot trust your conclusion. And that's why error rates are so important. And so, the PCAS report uh, was really focusing on that. It was saying like, if we're gonna evaluate the validity of these methods, what we care about is their uncertainty, like the, the error rates of the conclusions made by these forensic disciplines. And actually like for most of them, they weren't even measured at all. And so the, um, what I was telling you about the political polls, it would have just been, bam, an estimate, 75% of people are gonna vote for Trump or whatever, like some estimate, but we have no idea what the error bars look like. So we don't know if we can trust that. Um, so that's that's what the PCAS report was really instilling. And it, and it also talk, talked about how to measure these error rates. Now, and I'll talk about those in one second, but, there was a recent release in this year uh, from the outgoing Trump administration, a statement from the Department of Justice uh, about PCAST. And the, the DOJ spoke against PCAST and said that there were fundamentally wrong, incorrect claims. These claims, I mean, people are still processing this release, but basically, uh, I don't know, I think it's kind of, um, what do they call it? Like it's uh, shooting a straw man or I, I am mixing my metaphors, but there's this question of um, whether forensic pattern comparison disciplines are metrology. It's kind of like irrelevant. Like we're, you know, PCAS was all about, we have to get these error rates, but they also said, well, also forensic science is metrology. Excuse me one second. Maybe a construction next door. So the idea was that, it, so they said, oh yeah, you know, this is metrology, blah, blah, blah. You need to error rates and this is how you get them. And the DOJ report really latched onto this statement um, and said, you know, it's really not metrology. You're incorrect. And so everything in the PCAS report is incorrect. It's kind of like, well, I think that was not the main point of the PCAS report. Um, it said the validation of pattern comparison methods can only be accomplished by strict adherence to a non-severable set of experimental design criteria. They were upset that PCAST recommended um, 
one way specifically of, of measuring error rates, and they were upset that it was only one way. Uh, they think there are many ways of getting error rates. And then finally, they said, you know, the error rates for forensic pattern comparison methods can only be established through appropriately designed black box studies. Um, so they, they they think PCAS was being too strict, um, and that they were they were wrong that forensics was metrology, and therefore we should discard uh, PCAS. We should dismiss what it concluded. And I think, in my opinion, it's um, some of these complaints are kind of irrelevant, and they don't really address the main point of PCAS, which was about we need to get error rates for this. There are a few things about the statement that I do think are interesting, but I, I won't get into them um, right now. Okay, um, any questions so far? I was about to move on to the next. We're just talking about the validity and how to, how to get error rates. Um, let me see any, oh, no, no questions, okay. Um, and also, uh, Marissa, you will let me know if there are questions, right? Will do. And uh, just to point out that if you do have questions as we go on, including what is metrology, you know, feel free to you know, put that into the chat and we'll make sure we get that answered. Yeah, it's not even that important, but I guess they're latching on to that point. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> I want to focus on this. So the PCAS report defines a term um, with foundational validity. Now, this isn't widely used outside of PCAST, um, but I think it's a nice way to talk about scientific validity. And it says uh, this um, so foundational validity for a forensic science method requires that it be shown based on studies to be repeatable, reproducible, and accurate. And then foundational validity then means that a method can, in principle, be reliable. So I'll go into this. In what I'm going to unpack this. Uh, and then they also talk about validity as applied, which is, so the first one, foundational validity is a question of, is this forensic method in theory, like in the abstract, uh, before it's been applied for a specific case, but just the field in general, is it a valid discipline? And then validity as applied is once it was used for a specific case, was it used properly in that instance? Was it applied reliably practice? There's a little bit of noise that I'm hearing, and I don't know if it's... Oh, that's my computer. So sorry. Let me mute out. <laughs> Sounds a little bit like an air, air engine. I'm... Yeah. Okay. So this is, I think, if, if you take anything away from this entire presentation, this is the slide to take. Um, the slide itself doesn't say that much, but this what I'm going to say about it. <laughs> so PEAK has defined foundational validity as... Uh, having consistency and accuracy. So a forensic method is considered valid if it has these two things, consistency and accuracy. And what, what do those mean? Consistent is, uh, you know, are you getting the same answer every time? So what do we mean exactly by that? Imagine that you are uh, weighing yourself um, you say, oh man, do I have the COVID-15 or whatever, right? That I gained 15 pounds because I was sitting in this room for the past year. Um, and so you want to sit, you want to stand on a scale and see what you weigh. So suppose that I weigh, uh, it says the first time that I step on the scale, it says I weigh 170 pounds. I'm like, oh man, you really need to lose some of that weight. So I step off. So let's, let's just check it again. So I step on again, and now it says 120. I'm like, oh man, actually I didn't gain much weight. I think I'm doing great. And then you step off and you're like, well, let me just step on it again. And now it says 200 pounds. I'm like, all right, maybe the scale is crap and I can't really trust what it's saying because every time I get on the scale, it's saying a different value. So maybe the scale is broken. Uh, the scale is not being consistent in that case. Now, uh, there are two ways to be consistent. There's repeatable and reproducible. So repeatable is the same evidence with the same analyst. Uh, with the scale example, it's, it's the following. Uh, it's me, Maria, 
getting on the same scale that I have in my office uh, over and over. That example I gave you, that's, that's repeatable. If it's giving me the same answer within some very small variability, repeatable, that's good. Um, reproducible would be if I have different scales. So if I say, all right, well, I'm gonna test it in this scale and that scale, suppose that it always says 170. I'm like, all right, but maybe my scale at home is kind of crappy. I'm gonna test the scale at the gym because I think that one might give me a better lower number, right? So then I go to the one at the gym and it's like 120. I'm like, okay, great. I trust that one <laughs> because it tells me what I wanna hear. Um, so that was just saying that uh, that was not reproducible. Um, there must be a faulty scale somewhere. We expect if a method is reproducible is if scales are gonna be good, consistent at measuring weight, then it has to be that with the same evidence or with Maria's weight, it's gonna tell me the same thing no matter which scale I go to. So now how does this apply to forensics? That would be like saying, uh, suppose we have um, two hairs, so a pair of hairs from a crime scene and a hair microscopist is comparing um, the two hairs under a comparison microscope to see whether they belong to the same individual. And so analyst one uh, observes this pair and says, oh yeah, I think, they're, I think they're from the same person. Yeah, great. Um, same source, right? So that's my conclusion. All right, so then you trick them and you, you give them the same pair you know, two weeks later, and they maybe don't remember, or maybe it's a year later. And you say, hey, can you tell me these two pairs are from the same person? And they look at them and they say, no, no, I don't think they're from the same, same source. I think they're different source. That is telling you that that is not repeatable. In that sense, the method is it's giving you different results, um, even though it was the same evidence and the same analyst um, analyzing the evidence. Um, and then with reproducibility, it would be the same pair, but if you give it to like five different examiners, they're gonna give you different answers. We want the same answer every time, no matter if it's gonna be the same person or not. Um, that's consistency. In bite mark evidence, uh, there's a really interesting study that shows that the same analysts looking at the same bite marks, the same pairs of bite marks over time were getting totally different results. They kept changing their answer from whether they were a match or non match. Um, and then finally, accuracy. Um, accuracy is where error rates become really important. The question here is how close is it to the truth? So, right, so the, the, the weight at the scale example, uh, if I get on a scale, um, suppose that what I really weigh is 150. And uh, the scale says, okay, you weigh 155 plus or minus 10 pounds. I'm like, all right, yeah, that's within the, that's within the truth. I mean, that, that's, you know, I, like in that example, like I wouldn't know somehow, you know, I don't know the truth, but I'm telling you that if we did like in an experimental setting, we would get uh, within the, the margin of error, uh, we would have the right answer. And so accuracy, it's, a, it's important to basically to get accuracy, we need to be able to quantify uncertainty. We need to get error rates. There are different ways of quantifying uncertainty. There's also things like random match probabilities like in DNA. There's also likelihood ratios, which is something they're using more and more in Europe to give results of forensic comparisons. Um, in the US, I think they have used likelihood ratios with DNA but not with other types of evidence. There are margins of error, et cetera. So there are different ways of quantifying uncertainty. Uh, what I told you in that polling example, that just little, those error bars, that's one way of talking about it. Um, another way would be a false positive and false negative rate for say fingerprint analysis. Another way is random match probability, say for DNA, et cetera. But the main thing is we're getting some kind of idea for how likely is it that I'm wrong about this, right? So I have some conclusion. I think, you know, these pairs are coming from the same source, but what's the uncertainty on that? 
oh, well, I'm wrong half the time. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well, you know not to trust that very much. So if you have measures of consistency and accuracy, then you're able to know if you can trust that method. That's how I like to think about it. Is it trustworthy? And then there's this word of like, okay, is it valid? Is it reliable? And I think those are coming more from um, legal standards, right? Like federal rules of evidence, um, the Daubert standard, things like that. But the way I think about it is more like, is this trustworthy? Is this a scale that I would trust to tell me my weight or is it not? And that's, um, yeah, so that's a way of thinking about um, validity. And then validity is applied. Um, PCAST said a forensic examiner must have been shown to be capable of reliably applying the method and must have actually done so. So it's just like, okay, fine. Like there's a separate aspect of like, is this discipline valid? And then it's like, well, what about this like one analyst who used it in this instance? Did it, you know, was, was it done properly? And the reports, the PCAS report says the expert should report the overall false positive and false negative rates for the method, report a probative value for the observed match, and not make claims that go beyond the empirical evidence. And so it's kind of like they're saying, uh, you know, in order to, to have this uh, work in application, the analyst needs to tell you about the uncertainty that was that of their of their conclusion. Okay, are there any questions at this point? Nothing in the chat. Okay, so what are these ways to get error rates? So there's kind of an important difference uh, about between some um, different forensic methods. And that's whether it's a subjective or an objective method. And these two will require different assessments. So where's my definition of these things? Oh yeah, here we go. Um, PCAS defines an objective forensic method as one where um, the, the method is not relying on human judgment and could in theory be replaced with an algorithm. It doesn't require someone, a person having a specific human decision to make the, to arrive at the conclusion. So like DNA these days, high quality DNA is essentially, uh, can be replaced with an algorithm. It's an objective discipline and to get a measure of uncertainty for this, we can study the accuracy and consistency of each of the methods individual steps. Uh, for a subjective methodology, this is one in which the key procedures of the method will involve human judgment. And this is, I would say most forensic disciplines, I guess, I don't know, like toxicology is an objective method. That, that, that wouldn't be uh, included here, but things like a lot of the pattern comparison disciplines um, or impression evidence, those are all gonna be uh, pretty much subjective. So PCAST says for these subjective methods, uh, we must use black box studies to determine error rates. And this is what the DOJ statement was upset about. They said, okay, maybe we, do, we can study error rates in different ways. It doesn't just have to be this. But black box study is a very broad term. It's a very simple term um, that I'll tell you. Uh, yeah, this is pretty much it. So what's a black box study? So the first thing is it's called black box because uh, for this study, let me just before I do that, for the study, the, the results of the study, so the researcher running the study doesn't care about the reasons why examiners arrive at a conclusion. So this it's going to be a study where examiners are tested, and we just want to know whether they think it's an identification or an exclusion or an inconclusive. We don't care if they think it's an identification because there were little lines that they think are similar and because it's kind of curved in this way. We don't care about the reasoning. Just tell us the answer. Something like the, um, the SAT test, right? The standardized test. 
the SAT does not care why you picked C of the options. It just wants you to pick an option. Um, so a, a key aspect of a black box study is that it's an empirical study that's based on observation rather than theory. Seems kind of obvious, but uh, there have been arguments made uh, in forensics where they say, well, in theory, like you would only make a mistake one in every million times. Like, no, that's not, that's just theory. That's, that's not okay for a black box study. We need to do, have an observation. Like we need to actually empirically gather evidence to get an error rate. And how do we do that? So it has to be done with an, an experiment. And you know, that's a procedure carried out to support a refuted hypothesis. So what, I'm, what I mean by this is like, this has to be a study that's done independently of casework. Um, and in this uh, experiment or study, um, the idea is to assess, you know, the validity of a forensic method. Um, this study should be carried out by an experimenter, someone who's outside the, the everyday casework and is not a forensic analyst. Is someone, or I mean, they could have forensic analysis training, but someone who's removed and they're going to make all the questions and they're going to give the test to the analysts. So I keep thinking of the SAT, but like that's how. Uh, you know, or maybe you guys have like the GMAT. I have no idea how the GMAT works actually. So ignore that. The SAT is like multiple choice. So that's why I'm thinking of that one. But the idea is uh, there's a test that someone wrote is given out to all the students. The students answer the questions and then they're graded on their responses. And that's basically what a black box study is. It's just having analysts uh, be tested by an experimenter um, and to see how well they do. And the question is, you know, a lot of these forensic methods, um, especially the subjective methods, they'll have options that are, so like a, a fingerprint analysis uh, will give you a conclusion of, that's a category, that's an identification, an exclusion, or an inconclusive. And so if, an, if the, say, two prints were supposed to be an ID and the examiner writes exclusion and they get that answer wrong, that's going to be a false negative. That's an error in this one direction. If the two prints really not were not from the same person, and the exper and the examiner says, "Oh yeah, they're from the same person," that's a false positive. And then the question is, what's the false positive rate, and what's the false negative rate for a bunch of examiners that are being tested with this black box study? How many questions did they get right out of the total, and how many questions did they get wrong, and in what direction? We need a large enough sample size to detect this effect. You need enough examiners and you need enough questions in the test to be able to get an effect. Um, and we need to get both false positives and false negatives. Uh, you can take these false positives and false negatives and express them as things like sensitivity and specificity. That's just one choice that people make in how to state these error rates. But the main idea is just like, we just want to do a test and get an error rate for that method. That seems so simple. It's like, okay, why not do this for all the disciplines? Um, but they're actually just like, it's hard to get all the examiners to agree. And some people think they're not important. I don't know. It's been hard to do them properly, I guess. So they're still few and far between. Tons of studies. I mean, the PCAST reviewed 2000 studies. Tons of studies will only have like 10 examiners doing a test, or they'll be tested with fingerprints that were all same source and they were supposed to determine whether they were same source or not, uh, knowing that they were supposed to be same source. Or whatever it is, there are lots of experiments that people in the field in forensic science will say, this is a proper error rate study. But when you review it, you realize, no, it's not this seems like not a good error rate study. And PCAS goes into detail about that, about why they discarded so many of the studies that other people in, in the forensic science field think are, you know, error rate studies. So I won't go into these, but this is, oh, this is what I just said. So basically there need to be these empirical studies. Uh, there need to be several of these, right? Not just one, but like we need more than 
than one. Uh, we need to have a representative sample. Uh, this is kind of like that example I was just giving you about the, the polling. We don't just want to test the million people in New York City. We want to, or in Iowa or what, whatever I said, Arkansas. Um, we want to test the right population, something that's representative of the population we're interested in evaluating. There needs to be an adequate sample size. If we don't, if we have a very small sample size of examiners or of test samples, then we might have a problem where the noise is going to obscure the signal and we don't, we can't get an error rate from a very small study. We need to report false positives and false negatives and then uh, report this as with probative values. It's like, I mean, that's not that important, but basically there's like this idea of that, like PCAS was just kind of famous for saying like, we need black box studies to get error rates, um, especially for subjective methods. Because, um, you know, subjective methods are just, it's up to the examiner's opinion, right? It's their subjective human judgment to decide whether something is, um, you know, uh, an ID or an exclusion or inconclusive. And how can you question that, right? They just say, well, this is my opinion and I'm an expert. You're like, well, uh, yeah, but how can I know if I can trust you? Like, I don't know if I can trust you. Oh, I've, I've been doing this for many years. I was trained by the best. I've been accredited by blah, all these things. Yeah, but what about you and this and that? Like, first of all, there's a question of whether this discipline is even valid. Like you're not, I don't even know. Like if someone tells me, oh, I just tried this new odor technology and like, I am an expert at odor technology and I got that this is an ID. And you're like, is this even foundationally valid? Like, I don't know if this method is even consistent or accurate. Is it gonna tell me anything about the truth consistently? I don't know. And then uh, validity is applied. If, if it is valid, did you apply it validly this time or were you, like cheating or something, right? Like there's um, another example I didn't show earlier by this, a, a chemist called Annie Dukan, who uh, she would only test like two out of the 10 vials of blood and say that she found the drug content in all of it, whatever. She like found some, con some concentration of cocaine in the two that she measured. And then she would say they would all have it, um, that kind of thing. So she was just, not doing her job properly. Chemistry and that analysis uh, is valid, but her way of doing it was not in that case. So both things matter, right? Like the error rate in theory of the field and then whether we did it and applied it right that one time. So Maria, I actually wanna kind of interrupt a little bit right here. So it's three o'clock, we're, we're you're getting toward the close. So, and I know you do have a lot of material to cover. So the slides I've shared with folks um, you have heard Dr. Quare's take on the PCAST report and on the individual um, disciplines that were looked at, which I think is important. But I wanted to ask a question here, Maria, um, for those who do this kind of work in post-conviction, and they're looking at a case where there may have been a shoe print comparison or bullet comparison or one of the other trace evidence comparison, what kind of materials would you recommend that people, particularly the prosecutors, look for to try to answer those questions you just asked. Was this valid? Did this person apply the methodology validly? How, how can we get more information? Are there materials that you're familiar with that generally might exist from a forensic examiner that you know, a prosecutor or defense counsel could be asking for to try to make that determination? Are you asking about um, trying to evaluate the foundational validity aspect of it? About the field? Or the application of it. So for the, the analysts themselves, what kind of information can they look for to get some sense of comfort on you know, whether this was applied, yeah. whether this method was applied well? I think just um, looking at PCAST's guidance on validity as applied is what should be done. Um, the expert should be doing these things. Should they, they should report the overall false positive and false negative rates for the method. They should report the probative value of the observed match, they should not make claims that go beyond the empirical evidence. Now, for a lot of these disciplines, there are no estimates of false negatives and false positives. And so the, the expert can't do that. And then, I mean, it's something they should be doing, but often they can't do. And so then that's just gonna be 
a problem. Um, does that make sense? Does that answer your question, Marissa? I think it does, and I, but I think there's there are probably several folks on the calls who've had to deal with this in the past about going back to look at a forensic file and try to see whether there were um, tests that were run at the time, whether there's any indication of, even if it's a fingerprint test, you know, did, they, did they print out the number of matches they find or the similarity points or, or any dissimilarity dissim, dissim, dissim points that might have been in that report. Um, but trying to go back to the original forensics file to see whether or not that those bench notes, those notes are in the file and then analyze those to determine whether this kind of analytical framework was done at the time, even if it wasn't testified to it at trial, can be very helpful to try to help start making those determinations. And there are questions about looking for the analysts own accreditations, tests and standards and have they met those and, and, and all those, those are kinds of bigger questions that differ from lab to lab in terms of whether those are available and how, but those are some of the questions that folks can start to look at to determine whether uh, the methodology was valid, whether it was applied validly, whether this individual has some problems and yeah. things to be able to look at. Yeah, so I, uh, I think that it would be helpful to read the, uh, this, the guidance recommended by the various um, organizations that set up the standards. So there are the ISO standards um, for various methods. There are, there's guidance from the OSAC um, list uh, about what should be done to apply a method validly. There's guidance from various societies. So like the APTI would be for firearms and tool marks. Uh, so there are a lot of details about the procedures that should be followed step by step. Now, I'm not an expert at that. What I am an expert at is talking about this question of how do how should we evaluate the forensic method and whether that is a valid method in the first place. Um, and so, yeah, there are like a lot of standards you can read and see, you know, oh, an exa a, a firearms examiner should evaluate whether there is sufficient agreement between the two pieces of evidence. And sufficient agreement means that blah, blah, blah. I mean, they have different guidance and then, you know, different societies and different standards have recommended changing the types of conclusions given. So I think for, even for bite marks, they started saying uh, that the um, Association of Odontolog Forensic Odontologists, they started saying, don't say that, you know, we can give a match. Just say like we have, uh, we believe these two are similar, you know, and that we think. So there's, mm -hmm. but like what I was trying to cover today was more about how should the fields, um, in general, be evaluated. Like, do we even know whether bite marks uh, is a useful method at all? Um, and that can be used, I think in court as well, like if, if someone is using bite marks evidence, say, uh, you can question like the foundational, valid foundational validity of that. You could say like, well, can you even tell me an error rate of your bite mark analysis? Do you know any uncertainty in your, in your estimate that's not just based on theory? Do you have any empirically based uncertainty measures? Uh, and if you don't, if you don't have a measure of both consistency and accuracy of this method, I don't care how carefully you followed all the standards that are given, I cannot trust your conclusion. So my thing is even more like digging in at the, at the heart of it, or I don't know, maybe that's kind of too rough of a, an image, but it's, it's just cutting it from the root rather than uh, just saying, oh, well, you know, th the standard said you should have looked at three print, uh, three of the markings and you looked at two of them. No, I'm just saying like maybe the discipline as a whole is not trustworthy. Does that does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. That was kind of what I was trying to get. The one last thing I wanted to say before, I mean, I didn't have time to review the PCAS uh, conclusions about every single discipline, but that's on there. And, yeah. But there's this question of what's valid enough. So I told you that there, there's a recommendation for having error rates from black box studies. Uh, but then what if the error rate is super high? What if like, yeah, it's like one in 18 for fingerprints or something. Is that 
enough to say that a discipline is valid? Like what if it's one and two? The same as flipping a coin, right? I can tell you I analyze fingerprints or whatever, bite marks, um, some discipline, but if the error rate is one and two, then the same as flipping a coin. And so that's that. And, and PCAS does not give any guidance on what's valid enough, what should, what's a good enough error rate. Leave to uh, the judge or jury to decide. Uh, but one thing we can do with the different error rates is compare methods from one to the next um, to see, you know, how much better is one than the other. But uh, but it's still a very useful, very useful document, and it, it you know, it's a way to get to get at like what these forensic disciplines should have been doing from the beginning, like before anything was even introduced before tire prints or bite marks or whatever method, this should have been evaluated. We need to know the error rate in general before it's even used the first time. Uh, since it has been used, now we can start trying to do those studies and, and trying to improve things. As, as well. Great, yep. Um, and there's one uh, part in your slides, uh, Marie, where you're talking about uh, ballistics. And I don't know if you could, um, jump to that maybe and explain. I think a lot of people have cases that involve ballistics, may not fully understand what it means to do a ballistic comparison about you know, how that's done, what it entails, and then what PCAST had to say about that. Yeah, so in, in firearms, um, there are different types of analyses that can be done. The two pattern comparison um, discipline are- She's not happy, she's not happy. Hold on, give me one second. There you go. Um, and, and bullets and cartridge casings. Um, so I'll show you what. So, so in, fire, in firearms, there's also other evidence um, bullet lead analysis, that's pretty infamous, right? It was discredited. Uh, there's um, an analysis of the um, powder that was distributed when the, the gun was fired. That's not a pattern matching discipline. So like there are other things people analyze with a gun, mm -hmm. but uh, pattern matching disciplines include the bullet analysis and the cartridge analysis. And the, and the part of the bullet that's analyzed are these uh, land and break areas in the bullet. So the bullet is fired from the gun and the gun itself kind of, uh, and it expands because there's a lot of heat. Okay, sorry, I'm gonna share something that's actually helpful. <laughs> One second, this is actually really cool. Uh, it's just the, the video I show my students to explain this. And, and while she's loading that up for, uh, for people who have questions, by all means, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and reminder that if you can stay after to kind of talk about ways to kind of use this gathering for more interactive purposes, I'd be grateful. And I will launch a poll that will just ask for a quick feedback um, before you sign off. Okay, uh, so here's this video so basically there's a firearm and in here are the bullets inside the cartridge cases and at the top you see there's uh the barrel of the gun and the breech block of the gun and then a firing pin so what happens when you shoot a gun is uh there is some explosive powder in between the cartridge the end of the cartridge and the bullet the firing pin hits that uh, smokeless powder, there's an explosion, and then the bullet gets shot out through the barreling and the cartridge case flies off. Uh, the cartridge case, as the bullet is being fired, it, the cartridge case gets pushed back onto the breech block. And so it acquires uh, the characteristic marks from that breech block. Uh, and so that's what analysts are comparing between different test fires uh, and the and the evidence in the crime scene, they're comparing that backside of the cartridge, uh, specifically the the primer here, where there's uh, 
more evidence. I mean, the, this is the striation marks and the different marks that they're analyzing. So this is the main part of analysis in cartridge cases. And then for bullets, um, as the bullets are being fired, there's barreling inside this barrel. And so there's, there's like curvature. Uh, there are these little grooves that have curvature to make the bullet go straighter. And those grooves make some specific marks in the bullet. And so those marks are magnified with the microscope, and those are the marks that are being that are analyzed. And they look like this under so uh, these are the striation marks in a bullet that are compared. And so yeah, the, that's that's the that's the evidence that's compared, and the conclusions are going to be identification, exclusion, or inconclusive, and it's mostly done under a comparison microscope, although the state of the art is moving towards 3D scans and using algorithms to make comparisons. Well, interesting. Thank you. Um, so for the, the, obviously Dr. Cuero's, um slides are up there for you in the chat. Feel free to download that. There's a just a ton of information that she's given us on the PCAST report in particular on the different disciplines that were involved with that, as well as some materials that she included to kind of prime the pump for our next discussion, which will be about DNA evidence next month um, with Don Boswell, who was the, um, who will be joining us for two sessions, one on reading DNA reports and how you kind of interpret them. And then the second is about emerging issues with DNA analysis, particularly on uh, issues related to uh, new algorithms that are being used, mixture comparisons and things along those lines. So. Um, I want to take a, a moment just to say, Maria, thank you so much for being with us. I know this is, um, it, it just is incredibly important information for people to have. Um, I'm going to throw up this poll and ask you to very quickly fill it out for me before you leave. Um, but if anybody has questions for Dr. Cuellar, um, now is your time. And as I said, if you have time to kind of stick around, we would appreciate it. But let's look for anybody with questions first. Um, from the materials that, and by the way, I did not know what a black box study was, so I really appreciate finally understanding what that is myself. Um, so, any questions for Dr. Cuellar here? Feel free to unmute or put in chat whatever whatever's easiest for you. And I should say, I mean, you can also, if you have any specific questions, you can email me, and that you know that might be easier. Uh, I'll put I'll put her email up in the chat also for folks. Mm -hmm. um. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna um, go ahead and stop the recording from that for us.